Welcome back to Where Are They Now podcast. My next guest was a member of Big Break 2, which first aired in September 2004. Yes, 2004, 16 years ago. Uh, almost 16 years ago. Mike laughs about that because it's so long ago. Uh, the contest was filmed in Las Vegas, but remember, first had to have the stop in Ontario. And this is the guy, I mean, one of my favorites on the show too, and I know many of yours from the surveys we've done, missed that three-footer and took a bus ride. We're going to talk about that with Mike in a second. Uh, the winner received four exemptions to uh, the nationwide tournament, uh, or excuse me, nationwide tour in uh, the 2005 season. Um, imagine that the, the, this, these guys in big break two got four, and I'm not knocking the nationwide tour back then four exemptions. And then Jimmy from Myrtle beach, who we interviewed Toph, um, um, earlier this week, uh, he got $180,000 worth of prizes and cash and gift cards and all of that stuff. Uh, it's amazing. But these guys were the ones that laid the foundation. These are the guys that built this thing up, uh, and got the audience, so they deserve a lot of credit. They just didn't get the cash, unfortunately. That's uh, it. Additionally, uh, my guest was a member of the seventh season of Big Break. It was called The Reunion at Reunion. It featured eight, uh, 16 uh, males and female contestants from the first six seasons, and it was filmed in Reunion Resort in Kissimmee, Florida. That premiered on February 25th, 2007. This guy's got a ton of talent, and he's probably like the 10th guy that I've told this to, but... I just, you know, I'm so jealous of the demeanor on the course. These guys just, you know, the most they do is put their head down and then they shake it off and they go back and hit a bunker shot to three feet. It's, he, this is another guy that does that kind of stuff. Uh, it's amazing. Um, and I'm not a th club thrower or a swear or anything like that, but it just, it's really hard to come back when you're not playing well. You guys that, you know, hack it around the course like I do, you know the feeling. Um, and so, and he was also famous for that. I don't even know what the thing was called. It's when they had those dice walls and him and sean went at it for what felt like you know a half a day we're going to talk to big mike about that so big mike foster welcome to where are they now podcast we're happy to have you thank you i'm happy to be here awesome mike we're going to jump right into our quick hitter segment these are questions from our viewers and listeners and they sent them in and a lot of them uh come in and they ask the same stuff and then some of them were uh specific for you so we're going to go right through them um okay. Ashley from St. Pete, Florida, asked, did the production aspect of Big Break affect your game with the cameras, setup times, delays, reshoots? No. Um, you knew that's part of it when you get there. It is an all-day affair, though, when you, when you go to film a show because you film one show a day. So it basically you film three different segments, which takes anywhere from – two hours, about two hours each time, each segment. So, but the cameras are not bad. You just get used to them. Um, people are, are real good. I mean, the camera crews were great. So no, the, the camera crew did not affect, affect me at all. Yeah. It's amazing, Mike, when I look at, um, in doing my research and, uh, you look at some of the, the shots, the still shots of the production itself, and you see like 20 cameras, and then you see like a truck with a boom camera. And, and the first thought comes to my mind is, and I've been, I watched Big Break from season one, how do we not see these? Like the show goes on and you don't see a camera anywhere. I mean, occasionally you'll see in the early shows, you'll see a, a, a handheld, um, you know, uh, on the host when they're talking to you or maybe something like that. But as far as the play, and by the way, as it gone through 23 seasons, it's got so much better. Um, but it's amazing how they keep them out of sight. Yes, they, they do a really good job with that. And the camera crews are very professional, so it's, it's, it's a well-done event. Yeah, it really is. Hey, how about this? Big Mark from Baltimore says, hey, Big Mike, uh, was it tough mentally or physically? No, I'm sorry. Was it tougher mentally or physically uh, during your time on Big Break? Um, it was, it's more mental because of the long days, um, up at 5 AM and most nights like in Vegas, at least at the first show, we were not, we didn't get to bed till midnight. I mean, by the time we had to do a lot of extra stuff, like when we were in Vegas, we had to go to shows and stuff, um, which was a wonderful experience. But by the time we got in to bed and then we were trying to get up early to film, um, because it was 117 when we were out there for the first three days and it was 116, I think the rest of the week. So 
Um, no, it wasn't. It's more mentally um, than physical because you physically you kind of prepare, but mentally you just kind of get drained by the end of the week. Well, you just segued that into our sec- second or third question. Excuse me. Patty from Nebraska asks, asks, you guys look like you're up before the sun on some days. What was a typical day like? Typical day was 5 a.m. till midnight, um, given or take an hour here or there. But every morning we were up by 5 and rolling. Jeez. But we had the golf course by 6 a.m. But we ate in our room. Um, they had a penthouse suite with a golf stimulator for us. Um, but they bring breakfast up. We order breakfast every morning. It, they were just – the Golf Channel did an excellent job. It looked like it. You guys had that TV which would explode and some, you know, one <laughs> of the girls from Treasure Island would come up and talk. And then, I mean, it was just – it was so well done. And your food on the table was fruit and eggs. And, I mean, it, you couldn't ask for more than that. It was just awesome. And by the way, your show – you talk about the show – what they did with Kip and on stage, and that was, and you were sitting right next to him, I think, if my memory serves me, when he yes. went up. That was, just, that was hysterical. That was really funny. I was just hoping it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, Steve from Oak Brook, Illinois. Did you know any of the contestants from Big Break 1, and did you know any of the contestants when you arrived at Big Break 2? I didn't personally know any of the contestants on Big Break 1 um, beforehand. Um, I met them there because there were three of them that came out, but um, I didn't know any of them. And I didn't know any that were on our show at first. I'd heard of some of them like Kip um, had went back and stuff, but uh, those were the only ones I'd really know. And a matter of fact, me and Kip flew on the same flight in. Got it. Did you recognize that you were golfers or? No, because I think we were separated on the plane by so much. I don't think, and most people don't recognize me as a golfer. I mean, I'll be honest, with my size, people don't think. So they um, they just don't picture me. And, you know, a lot of people look like golfers on airplanes. I mean, they're they're wearing the caps, they're wearing the, you know, the polos. So it kind of just fits in. But, no, I – the only one I guess I would have known on our show would have been Jay. I'd seen him on Big Break One because he was the um, People's Choice. Yes, yes, I remember that. Mike from Framingham, Massachusetts, wants to know what happened to eliminated players. I believe this was the first se- or the last season, excuse me, that they were sent right home after being eliminated. Is that right? On Big Break Two, we were all sent home after we were eliminated. The next day, you were on a flight out. Um, it was just the way it went. You moved out of your room down to a different hotel room because we basically had the whole top floor at Treasure Island. We were there. Now, when I did Big Break 7, the Lemonade players were sent to a private house. The, but I was not part of that because I never ended up getting eliminated. I got eliminated on the last day. Right. So I didn't do that part of it. Um, but, yeah, they went to a private house and were able to stay and even play golf all week. Who was the lady you were you were paired with on the reunion? You guys look like you were hit it off, like you've known each other forever. She's that golf coach, right, at like ECU, I think? Yes, Kim. Kim, that's right. I'm sorry. We were both – I mean, we were both a little bit older, and it just kind of – we blended, and it, our personalities really blended. We were both kind of easygoing, and so that was, it made it for a great partnership. Yeah. And folks, I just want to let you know, I was talking to Mike before we jumped on the air and, and uh, invited him to our special reunion show that we're going to do, hopefully at the end of July. Um, and he accepted. So we're really excited about that. We're going to have about six of the reunion folks on a live stream and we're going to have everybody on the Zoom and you guys can fire your questions away uh, and we're going to do that live. So that's going to be a lot of fun coming up. Um, we're going to work the quick hitter questions through the whole show. So the pre big break, we're going to talk to Mike about, we're going to talk about the challenges and then we're going to talk about post break, but we've pushed some of the questions off because they just fit in different parts of the interview. Uh, programming note, if you want to have your questions answered by your favorite big break star, uh, during the quick hitter segment, send them to us at where are they now podcast on every social media, um, channel you can get or at where are they now podcast at gmail.com or at our website, where are they now podcast.com next week interviews with, uh, Andy Walker, um, Mark Murphy, Cindy Miller, Brian Cooper, and the winner of Greenbrier, uh, Mark Silver. So a lot more big breakers on the way up. So 
Big Mike, let's talk about the process. Uh, your fans want to know, how did you did re- realize that Big Break had tryouts? Were you a fan? Um, tell us about your tryout. Give us a little of the process that it all started this. Sure. My, first of all, I would not have ever even entered for the Big Break had it not been for my cousin who filled out my application form for me. He's like, you need to get back. Because I had basically quit golf. I played – for 10 years, I played the Nike Tour, the you know, the web.com, whatever you want to call it. And I've been playing on the Hooters Tour. And I, I had given golf up for about five years. And he's like, you need to go out for this. And I'm like, I'll try it. I mean, you he's filled all the applications. I said, if they think I'm worthy, I'll I'll do it. And I got an, in, a letter in the mail that said, hey, you have an audition at Myrtle Beach on – whatever day it was back then I can't remember and so I went up to Myrtle Beach not with very high expectations of my family my wife and my son we went up there and we were just kind of went to the driving room you went to the driving range there was a like a tent to register and stuff and then they sent you over and they're like okay go over here and they had somebody come over and they're like hit five shots so I'm like okay no problem I can hit five shots and then they went over and you hit five different shots. You know, like one was like wedges, one was like five irons, and one was like drivers. That was pretty much the audition. And then you went and did an interview with the um, a camera crew, which seemed very easy to me. I mean, I didn't see any problem. I mean, they asked the questions, you answered them. <laughs> um, it was kind of fun. I mean, it, it was sure – seemed like a lot of work for not a very long amount of time in an audition. But to find out that there were over 10,000 applicants trying out for Big Break 2, not all of people got auditions. Um, right. I think they were saying that each site had about 200, 250 people. And I think there were four or five sites. Jeez. Wow. So you try out. How long after that time, Mike, do you hear from them to say you're a finalist or – they in touch with you at all during that or no, they don't stay in touch. With you. <laughs> they didn't at all. Um, all of a sudden they, um, it must've been a month, maybe even a month and a half. Yeah. They called and they said, Hey, we'd like to come follow you around for a day and do a day, a segment, a day in the life of, you know, for possibly you're down to the final such and such amount of people. Well, to find out afterwards that that pretty much meant you were in because what they did is they come and followed you around for the day. Me being, I work for a living. I was still, I was trying to work and play golf and that doesn't work. (laughs) I mean, I'll be a flat honest to play at the level that's needed. That doesn't work. Um, So they followed me around Sam's club at that time. And I was an order. I I pulled orders for people. And then after I'd get off work, I'd go hit balls. So they followed me to the golf course. And fortunately for me, the gentleman that owned Crosswinds Golf Course here in Savannah, he um, he was letting me play and practice out there. So I didn't have any expense to go along with it. So um, they went out there, and he they were all following us around. And there were people. And then they made a call. They called us on during, during the round and said, oh, we decided that you're in. So pretty much when they decided to do a day in a life, you were in. But you didn't know it really. You, you still thought they were auditioning you with others. But I, I believe everybody that did a segment like that was probably yeah. pretty much a done deal. And you, we, they showed the calls on the show, I think, right? Didn't they show yes. the phone calls into it? Because I remember Don like diving onto his wife and like getting emotional about it and crazy. That was pretty cool. That's neat. Yeah, everybody got calls at different times. Mine just happened to be while I was out there um, on the golf course. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, some were at home. Um, I think Don's was at home and Kip's mm-hmm. Kip's might've been at his wife. I think they had a little furniture store or something. Um, so yeah, they were all at different times. Shelby was at home now that I've seen the, you know, seen it afterwards, but you just didn't know. I mean, like I say, I think they, 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 they were done deals when they called, when they called to do the day in life thing. That's pretty cool. So you find out that you're on, I'm sure there's probably another waiting period, maybe a week, two, three, whatever. Do you know where you're going? I know I've talked to a bunch of big breakers. You sign the contract. You can't talk about the thing. You can't talk. You don't even, don't you hand your phones in when you get there and all that. It's pretty top secret, right? 
I'm not even sure we had phones back then when we went, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, we, you, you don't, you have no connection with the outside world. You don't have any idea where you're going. They send you a plane ticket, you know, when I first seen mine, it said Ontario. I'm thinking, Oh, Canada. Cause that's where that, that was a big thing. The first show, you know, was up in Michigan and, yep. and then as I looked at it, I'm like, wait a minute, I grew up in California. That's, that's Ontario, California, not, and then I thought, oh, Palm Springs. Oh, go. Sumner and Palm Springs. Yeah, that's perfect where they'd be having the show. Um, so you didn't have any idea that where you were headed other than Ontario and pack your bags and you'll be there for how many ever days up to like 16 or 17 days. You kind of touched on this, but I'm going to go back to the quick hitter segment. So, Mike, you now arrive to Ontario. Um, tell us what really happened. Did you guys all meet up just like it shows on television and then go through the drive to the, um, the jet and all that? Is that all real? That's how it worked out. That's exactly. And that, that's one thing I have to give a lot of credit to the, the big break. Everything you see is exactly what happened. There's nothing there that made it. There was nothing that we were doing different. I mean, we got there, we got off the plane there were camera crews. They took us to the room where we had lunch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we all got there at different times. Um, but that was exactly, and the whole show is exactly like that. That's when cool. you go, what you see was not asked of you or at any time to do anything different. Now, Don kind of thinks they made him out to be the bad <laughs> guy a little bit. But, that I mean, Don was high strung. It was, he was great. It was great for the show. Yeah. And it, it really you know, projected us up. I mean, yeah. our show's, I think, the highest rated one ever. His, oh, it is. It was the highest rated show on G Golf Channel. Not only the highest rated Big Break, but it was the highest show rated ever right. on yeah. Golf Channel. It's pretty cool. He was great for the show. I mean, he, I mean he, there was different personalities because you had Dave Gunness who had bare feet. And yeah. had a lot of different – you had a lot of young kids. You had a few older. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, a, it was a good mix. It really was. I agree with you there. So let's take another uh, quick hitter question. Uh, Mike, did you really have to ride the bus just for missing that putt? And by the way, you lipped it out. They could have gave you another shot at it. You know, that, but. I rode the bus for seven, almost eight hours. Oh. Um, it was a great it, it was a great experience, except for the bus really broke down. <laughs> and when they show that on the video, it makes it look like it was pretty quick, but we were sitting on the side of the road for about an hour and a half, maybe oh. two hours. It was great, though. I mean, the experience, the time, me getting the extra time on the first show because I got a ride with Matt, um, we had a ball. I mean, we just joked the whole way. We It was great. I mean, and then when I got to Vegas, you'd have thought I was a rock star hitting Vegas. These people in the, when the casino, because I came in by myself. Yeah. So I was the only one coming in and all these people, I mean, there's probably five or six cameras following you and people, you know, it was almost midnight when I got there and these people were like, Oh my God, this guy's gotta be important. You can hear him. And I'm like, if you only knew that I just rode eight <laughs> hours in a bus from Ontario, California here. And it was an old raggedy bus. Oh, that's funny. But that's it funny. was, it was good for me. That's great. So two things real quick before we get into the actual challenges and uh, the events that uh, took place on Big Brother. I want to do two things. One, first, I want to talk about pressure because everybody talks about the pressure of Big Break. And then I want to do a little um, word association with uh, Big Mike about a few of the players on the show, particularly Double D and Bart and Sean and Kip. Those are the four we're going to touch on with Mike. Just get his perspective of those guys when he met him. And, uh, and we'll do that. But I want to talk about pressure first. Mike, everybody talks about the pressure of Big Break. And I recently um, had an interview with Mark Silvers, and he talked about a lot about the fact that even in tournaments, big tournaments that he's played in, that he's never experienced that kind of pressure. Mark Murphy said the same thing. A number of the guys, I had Ray um, Bofel um, the other day said the same thing. A lot of it has to do with the talent of the group you're in. And by the way, you had one of the talent, most talented groups of, of them all. Sometimes it has to do with the weather somewhere out there in freezing cold and when, wind. And, and one of the components that really I've realized is the big component is the downtime of the actual production, 
right? You're sitting on a bench for two hours and then they say, hey, Big Mike, you're shot. And you go get one swing and you go sit down. I mean, tell us a little bit about how difficult that was to handle. That That's the hardest thing. You go out, first you warm up and you, you don't know what you're going to do. So they send you out there and they go, okay, go warm up. Well, what do we want to do? Well, you got to go through your whole routine every time you go. And then when you get sent out there, you know, you got, you start there standing there with, we had Rick Smith and, and um, they go over the challenge that's coming in hand, but you very possibly could be there two hours before you hit one shot. And for us, it was hot. So it wasn't as much that you, you know, you got tight, except for the longer you sit there, the more bad shots you hit, the more good shots you hit, you see in front of you, the more, you know, the more the pressure builds. So I always like to be towards the beginning of this, the shots, but it didn't matter. I mean, I, I, I was on all sides. Sometimes I was last. Um, sometimes I was first. Um, it just, there is a lot of pressure, but when we did big break seven, the first challenge we ended up doing, I was last, our team was last and it was a 190 yard shot with wind blowing 35 miles an hour from left to right in India a little bit. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I've just sat here two hours and now I got to hit a three iron, you know, to a, a very small target. Yeah. Um, that's tough. But it is what it is. You got to make the best of it. And you look at it, the whole, everybody's going to be put in it at some time. So yeah, there is a lot of pressure because it is one swing. There's no do over there. Are no mulligans. Yeah. It just doesn't work like that. Right. It is what it is. So let's talk about some of your teammates, uh, in some cases, competitors. Um, Talk about Double D a little bit. People know Double D from just what you said, right? He's an emotional guy. He's a very competitive guy. You know, people often talk about Don uh, Donatello, about his famous, you know, pull that thing tight when he wanted to, we're doing the measurement. But one of the things I noticed last night in preparation for this interview, Mike, was when you guys were doing that 4v4 um, contest where you actually play four, you're down to eight guys, you guys are playing golf, right? And – Don starts arguing about who goes for I they he he's I'm only 167 yards out he's 169 yards and actually Kip says to him Don don't worry about it he goes double D don't worry about it he's competitive at every single aspect talk a little bit about Don Donatello that was Don exactly what you see on the tape he's he's really a good guy off the course and he's not I mean what it is on the course he's competitive but he's so high strung. Um, and unfortunately for him, in the long run of golf, that probably didn't help him out. Um, you know, it's one thing on a shorter show version, but to be that, you can't live and die with every shot. I mean, golf has played over 18 holes um, and usually over diff multiple days, and that will wear on you to no end. And he wore on some people on the show. There were a lot of people on the show that had probably had enough of him by the time they – but you know what? I give it all to him. He, he, he made our show in some aspects because, you know, people wanted to see what he was going to do next. That, that was pretty much it. What's Don going to do next? What's he going to – I mean, the booyah. You the, right, when the putt, yep. The, the yep. Woody hit in the time we played the challenge with the three, um, the three guys from Big Break 1, signed, sealed, and delivered. Yeah, signed, sealed, delivered. The, and it was over the green. I mean, and it just, that was Don, though. And people need to, you know, understand it's one thing to do it on the show. I don't think that is the way you can make it in the world of golf. Just they, when you play in four days or whatever, you can't, can't be that high strung. And he's not like that off the course. So it's just he's competitive. And that's, that was Don. <laughs> one perfect example of what Mike's speaking about is – if for you guys uh, out listening and watching, watch the U.S. against Europe show. Don has a guest appearance. I think he told me, um, he did tell me, that when they flew him out, uh, they were only going to fly him out for one day and fly back the next. And he turned it into a little mini vacation, but he was actually only on camera for one day. And he got into it with the Europe guys because um, some one of his team members hit the ball in the junk and they were trying to find it and nobody was helping and Don was getting all the- it was a, it was just Don being Don again, you know, it's just, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I was there with that on that filming 
Um, it was uh, me, Don, and Dave Gunnis. Dave Gunnis, that's right. You guys were there. Yeah. And he said and that you guys, Dave, turned it into a mini vacation. You guys said, we're not going for one day. <laughs> they took us for a week. I mean, they put us up at Karnuski right overlooking the golf course for one week. Nothing. We, had, we got to play golf. 36 holes a day. They paid for oh. everything. We had an absolute ball. Wow. Uh, but that the incident you're talking about was a perfect example. We were playing, and it was a three-man scramble, basically. And we had hit it off the tee, and the second shot was Dave's. Well, Dave's clubs had got lost. So he didn't have his club. So he was using, a, like, a rental set. Well, he hit it in the gunch to the right. Let's just put it that way. And then, um, I mean, it, he was in weeds. And, well, Don hit the next shot because he, played, he played a provisional. And Don hit it like two feet. So we were just going to go put it in. Well, they started looking for the ball, of course. They wanted to look for the ball because we were going to make five the other way where if they found that ball, we were going to make at least five, if not six or seven. Right. Um, and Dom was like, oh, no, we just, we're just we just going to leave it. Don't worry about it. And they're like, no, 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 no. But if we got up there and would have made the putt prior to them finding it, we could have done that. But like I told Don, I said, this is not our show. I said, I will not go put that. It was my turn to put the ball in. Right. I said, we will not go put that ball in just to do that. Right. And he was all mad. Oh gosh, he, <laughs> he thought I thought the world was going to end. I'm like, come on, it's not. We're not. The show is not about us. This was about the the Ryder Cup format over there, the Europe versus American. It was a fun show for them, but yeah, we made a vacation of a week for us. That's awesome. Tell us about um, who I think was probably, in my view, on the outset, first maybe six episodes, I thought the guy that was going to win the thing, which was, which was Bart. Bart was the best player on our show at the time. Um, he didn't win because I don't think he had the experience. And, and that's what ended up taking Kip to the winner's circle. Um, but Bart, Bart had the best golf swing. Bart had – he had the whole game. I mean, he, he had a good short game. I knew I wasn't going to win relatively soon because I hadn't, I, I could tell my practice, I didn't have enough time to practice to be sharp enough to, you know, somewhere I was going to falter. Um, so I, I knew I was kind of just battling <laughs> to stay in there as long um, the first time. Um, but Bart, Bart was by far the best player on our show. I mean, talent wise, just he was better than everybody else. Yeah. So let's talk lastly about the uh, eventual winner, Kip. Um, You had the elimination match against him, and obviously obviously he's uh, catting on the PGA Tour now. Tell us a little bit about Kip. Kip's a great guy. Me and Kip are still friends. Me and Don are still friends. Um, We still kind of – like I went last last year to Hilton Head and seen Kip. I go and see him whenever he's around Savannah area. Um, He's just laid back. Kip is – just me and Kip could be absolute partners. You know, we just get along. We, we kind of have the same attitude. Um, but, you know, there's nothing going to bother Kip. I mean, he's not going to get bothered by, like I say, Don, or he's not going to get bothered by anybody else's actions. He's just – he's laid back um, and a good guy. I mean, we I, – I hated that he eliminated me. Um, but we had had some, you know, fun – fun beforehand um there was a couple incidents like he won't tell ever ever tell anybody about but i'll go ahead we were doing this thing and he had won the exemption and we were at uh, um we he, everybody was trying to take a break when you won the exemption you kind of could sit back and relax well, he was behind a man and he threw a golf ball hit me in the back of the head he won't tell anybody about this but <laughs> um <laughs> He felt awful. He was like, no, if he gets sent home today, I'm going home. And I'm like, no, you're not. I mean, that's not, you know, it wasn't anything that was that bad. He was just playing around trying to make it look like somebody hit a golf ball into us out at, um, I think. And he had just, and he wasn't competing. He had been. No, no, that's, that was it. He was. Immunity. He had immunity. He was behind like a sand dune embankment because i think we were at royal links at on that day 
So you could get behind. They were like sand dunes. And he threw this golf ball at it. It hit me. And I'm like, where the heck did that come from? And he's like, he felt awful. I mean, and I'm like, don't worry about it. It's not that big a deal. But he's like, if I go, if you go home, I'm, I'm telling him. And he told um, Paul, who was the director of the show for the Golf Channel, he's like, if he gets eliminated, I'm going home in this place. And Paul's like, you can't do that. And I'm like, no, you're not doing that. I mean, I ended up winning the, the um, final challenge anyway, but he felt, he felt awful. He still talks about it today. The, uh, we, you were not going to go through every one of the challenges because we could be here forever, but I do want to touch <laughs> on the first one. You come out and the first, the first, a lot of the um, subsequent big breaks, they've started off with either breaking glass or wall or da da da. And you start off with working the ball left and working the ball right. Your sh- first shot was 20 feet around there. And your second shot, I think you're going left to right. Well, that was that one. And you buried it like four feet or something inside. And you won that immunity in the first one. That's got to make you feel really good out of the gate, right? Yes. That, well, that, that played right into my strength. My ball striking has always been the strength of my game. Um, and working the golf ball left to right and right to left um, was always what I did best. Um, so I, when that was the first challenge, I was like, wow, I'm going to start out. Hopefully I'll take advantage of it. And I did. I hit. With, I think the first two shots we hit were right to left. We had to hook it around the thing, and then we got to hit it left to right. And this, I mean, I, I was like, this is right up, right up my alley. So I was thrilled. The only thing that kind of disappointed me was the the um, the next challenge Break was the glass, glass breaking. Yeah, and I didn't get this paid. Did you get to even have a practice shot off camera? I hit oh. nothing. I didn't get a chance to do anything because you were there. I, I mean, open for. It. Yeah, I remember that the um, – what's his name? The host says to you, hey, Mike, I thought you'd be up by the pool somewhere. And you're like, oh, I'm just yeah. – you had a towel around your neck. You're like, no, I'm just chilling out. And and I'm thinking, oh, maybe you'll get to take a swing, but nope. Nope. And I and that, that's the thing. When you win, a, like, the first – we all, we did an uh, immunity, the first one, and then uh, um, a mulligan, which was the right. glass break. That, and then elimination was the end. So if you won the first – challenge you were done for the day you just kind of relaxed um but you were you were still out there with everybody nobody went home nobody could do you know yeah so it wasn't that you got your i mean it was, it was an advantage but you couldn't get out of the heat you couldn't go do i mean except for you didn't warm up every you didn't have to warm up every every time you went out there for 30 minutes got it so you guys did a bunch of di- a lot more challenges it seemed back then than they do now it seems like it's condensed a lot there you did the under the bridge kind of thing where you had to go through the thing you went around both sides you went you did a putting challenge with the booyah from don you did that four and four skills competition um you did a bunch of um competitions like that did you have a favorite after doing all those um my favorite challenge was probably the dice challenge that me and sean got in and that was cool we did we went just back and forth, back and forth, I think 10 times or, or something, maybe even more. Um, but, you know, I, I miss not being able to play. I like when I did break, we did brick break seven. We got to play a little more golf, you know, two holes here or two holes there. Yep. To me, that was a lot better. Um, basically on two, I don't think we played golf except those couple times we did those two challenges. Yeah. Um, we, but we didn't really get to play a whole lot of extra golf and we played no golf other than what was filmed. There was no extra time to go play nine holes or, um, we played no golf. Well, I shouldn't say the first day when we get there and we, we did our photo shoot, we did go out and play nine holes. I playing think golf. the whole group did. Yeah. All of us went played, but it was just a short, it, it wasn't much. And like I say, it was just a, the first day when we were doing, because the first day, the whole day is spent photo shooting and like we did a sign, we took photos at the sign. And then at night we got on the billboard at Treasure Island. We were on the um, big sign and everything. So things like that, you can never take back. Matter of fact, I, I filmed, I had the, I copied big break too. When they had it on the golf channel, I recorded it in just to see, your name on the marquee in Las Vegas. I mean, it's it's pretty, really really pretty neat. I mean, for a long time, people would notice you all the time. Every time you went somewhere, um, 
I'm, I went back to Vegas, I want to say about eight months after we filmed the first show, and it was unbelievable. You'd walk down the strip, and people are like, that's the guy from the show, that's the guy from the show. But they won't, most, more often than not, they don't come up to you. Really? They just say, you can hear them say, no, you, you will get some that, you know. I used to get it at Sam's. People would stop in our Sam's club, and they'd walk around just to look for me because they would be like, but they wouldn't say anything. They'd walk by me and you could see them look and you knew that they knew, Hey, wait a minute. That's the guy, you know? Yeah. It was, it was so funny. Cause you know, I, I'm not, I'm very approachable. I'm not, I've always right. thought of it as an honor to be on the show. And, but these people are like, it's so funny to watch them walk by you or, and, and they're talking. I mean, like there'd be groups. That's him. That's him. He, yeah, he was on the show. He was on the show. And I, <laughs> Still today, get people that remember me from that show. Oh, I believe it. I believe it. And they have had is Big Break two on the um, the um, binge watching. They've been putting a bunch of them on more recently now. I think it they, was on the. I think it was the second one, first or second one on. Yeah, I thought it was too. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. They're talking about um, replaying we, that. We stuff. were on. I don't know, maybe a month ago. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it was neat. I, I was able to DVR it on my home screen so now i have the whole show to to look over and cool. my child when i filmed the first show my child was must have been six or seven 24 now so <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome so mark from long island new york asks and you were just talking about it uh his question was tell us about the event that you and sean battled that was amazing that you guys kept tying how long did it go on for and was it worth the time? <laughs> yeah, it was the show. That part of it probably went on. Me and Sean probably went an hour back and forth. Wow. Um, Cause I, like I said, I believe it was 10, maybe 11 times, just me and him, not including the rest of everybody went first. So just me and him ended up and Sean was just swinging as hard as he could. And he was trying to hit it through the hole. And I don't think he was really trying to hit it through the holes, but the ball was just going through the holes. <laughs> um, oh, he's swinging so hard. It was unbelievable. Because there was one time he hit it through the hole that wasn't even the hole of a different dice. <laughs> I mean, it was just – he was just – but you know what? That was Sean's attitude. Sean was a baseball player, mm -hmm. and he had drafted by the Rockies, and he you know blew out his shoulder or something and wasn't able to play professional baseball. But he – he was just he was just easy going and he was just wrapping them as hard as he could and I'm just trying to pitch him through there with my little eight iron and he's just going at it. But we were probably doing that for over an hour. Jeez. So let's talk about your elimination briefly. Just give us a summary of what you thought about it. Was it the right time? I mean, never the right time for you to go. That's not the right thing. But I you and Kip facing off. I mean, it's nighttime out, it's under the lights. It's like, could we go longer in the day? You go bunker to bunker, then you got to bury that putt at the end, and you have to have it. Just tell us a little bit about that. It was not one of my favorite challenges, and not not because I got eliminated. I didn't like the aspect of having to go back at eleven o'clock at night to film a show, um, and it's a lot different. Your depth perception and stuff, with especially with the bunker shots. I, I was fine until we got into the bunker shots and was like, okay, that's not really a good judge of the talent because you just can't tell as much. I mean, like one bunker was like real bright and the other bunker was like kind of darkish. Um, but everybody had to do it. So, I mean, it was no, no disadvantage to me over anybody else. Everybody was involved. Um, and it just, it, it was pitch. It was so quiet out there at that. I mean, I think it was probably by the time we ended up filming the last part of it was probably one o'clock in the morning, oh. maybe a little later, even um, when I hit my putt, if you see the show, you'll see that some, there was a camera crew that dropped his camera right in the middle of my stroke, but you know what? It is what it is. It's, it's part of golf and that, but being that it was done in the middle of the night, there was no noise. So, you know, if it was during the day, there was there would be a little bit of noise. There was none. So you, you could hear everything. So I want to tell you something about your 
buddy Don Donatello, he, when he was talking about players on the show, he mentioned you and he said, I want to tell you what kind of guy Big Mike is. He said, remember how he loses the – or gets eliminated. And I said, yeah, he missed that putt after coming out of the bunker and blah, blah. And he said, you don't know what happened. And then he tells us the exact story that you just told us. And you, again, you blew over it. But he said it was in his backswing that that was dropped. And I don't know if he said there was a discussion that you, whether you should be able to redo it or you just went on and it just went on or the players talked about it later when you were gone that, man, that's really not fair. That was kind of what he said about that story. I believe there was a little discussion between Paul and I believe it was Kip about redoing it. And there was no way I would redo it. That's not golf. Golf is a, you know, right. That's part of it. So you take it with, you take the good and the bad. And I would never have replayed it. Even if they had offered, um, I would not have, to me, that wouldn't have been the correct situation, but there was a little discussion because of the noise, but I would never have, taking that up and I know Kip was talking he you know he told me but afterwards that he went to Paul and wanted to you know I'm like no I wouldn't have done it anyway so the show's over for you you return home it airs are you instant celebrity in town do you have a viewing party tell us a little bit about what happens immediately after big break shows on the air well first you come home and it, it, that's probably the I was the one that probably tried to get them to stop sending people home because I'm like you don't understand when I go home at 10 days, these people are all going to know I came home. I mean, yeah. people I know, you know, they're going to ask me and I'm going to say, no, I can't tell you anything, but they're going to know if I'm home at 10 days or eight, nine days or eight, you know, whatever it may be, I didn't win. So I'm like, you'd be better off to keep people here and let them right. see the last shows. And they were like, well, you know, you have a point. And I'm like, I don't mind going home. That's not at all it. Um, but I, I mean, I wouldn't say an instant hero. Like I say, I, a lot of people notice you. Um, we did have a viewing party the first night um, it, when it came out. And it happened to be a bunch of friends from out where we lived on Wilmington Island at the time. And we were friends with a gentleman that owned Beefo Brady's. And he had us all there. And, you know, they did like a little – set up like a food buffet and drinks and stuff. There were probably 40 or 50 people there. Oh, nice. But nice. more more local people that, you know, and then me being from basically, I'm, I'm originally from California. So I have people there and then I moved my wife from Indiana. So there were people there that knew. So they all kind of gathered in different places. But we did have a little gathering. Matter of fact, we had a gathering for the first six weeks every night at before every Monday night or Tuesday night, whatever night it was on at before Brady's. That's pretty cool. Awesome. So tell everybody what big Mike's up to today. What are you doing? Big Mike has had two recon total reconstruction ankle surgery on his left ankle and foot. Um, yeah, not, not the best. I haven't played any golf in pretty much four years. Um, I just, I was out a whole year. Well, really, I had, um, I ended up with a real bad infection on my right foot. Um, basically, like you, the flesh eating disease that you can see people oh, with. Mercy. And I had to tear out my whole, they took a bunch of meat off my foot. And uh, I'm fortunate enough to have both my feet. My doctor's phenomenal. Um, and he saved my foot. That was on an Easter, six years ago, Easter, Sunday. And then, Four years ago, matter of fact, about this time, I had reconstructive ankle surgery where my foot and ankle had been basically um, from my diabetes. The shark, I developed Charco disease, which is a blood that gets in your and makes your bones kind of fragile in your feet. Um, and I have eight or nine screws that I had done at the Mayo Clinic. Um, I'm very fortunate. I'm, I'm walking. I'm, you know, I'm able to do a lot of things still, but I am right now on disability, and I'm I don't play much golf. I I will like try to get out and play. I'm starting to play a little more. I can hit a few balls here and there. But um, my son's become a golf junkie. He go. went to Syracuse, played football, never played golf in his life. A year ago, he decides he wants to play golf. I'm like, what do you want to play golf for? <laughs> um, you know, and it. 
for him, he's, it's been a great. He plays all the time. Um, so I try, you know, he's been trying to talk me into playing. So I'm, I'm trying to hit a few balls here and there. So I don't want to go out and totally embarrass myself. But me and him are going to start playing a little bit. Um, not as much as he would like me to play with him, but he he will be moving to Dallas. So with his job. So no, we. I don't play much at all. Unfortunately, a few charity events here and there. If I can get in, if they, you know, somebody asked me, but nice. my ability level is not where it needs to be. So I don't play. Got it. Last question <laughs> for you. Looking back on the big break experience, how would you define it? Just summarize what it meant to you. The big break experience to me was absolutely a wonderful experience to give me a, to play a little bit of golf. For the end. Like I say, I had quit altogether for, after I played, um, the chance to get out there and compete with people that, you know, want to compete. That's mm-hmm. – golf is all about competition. And I don't care if you, you're good, bad, or what. You compete. I mean, if you're a 90 shooter and you're, you're competing to get to the 80s, I mean, and it doesn't – it doesn't matter. I mean, golf can be played at all different levels. I mean, I tell people all the time, good golfers and bad golfers can play together a good tennis player and a bad tennis player cannot play tennis together. You know, the only other sport that a good and bad can play together is bowling. But um, it was, it was a great experience. I met some great people. Um, I've, I've been blessed to be able to play golf and do it for a living for a while and to meet great people in the, the game and meet people even outside of golf. I mean, like I say, through the show, I mean, you know, you go through an airport every once in a while, and people are like, hey, and they'll stop you or whatever. Or they won't stop you. Some, some will just, you know, kind of, they're they're scared, and I'm like, I don't be scared if you want. Some. But I was just in, I went to the golf show down in Orlando. I hadn't been in years. My son, we went down and we were walking around, and I seen guys I played on the Nike tour with, and. You know, this one guy's like, I played college golf with you. I'm like, that's 30 years ago or better. <laughs> <laughs> so, do, you, do you have, I got to work this one last question in from Linda from Phoenix, Arizona. She asked just that question. That's why I want to ask it for. Um, she said, was there any kind of celebrity moment from your fame at Big Break that you met somebody you wanted to meet ever happened to you? No, not really. I mean, I never really met anybody that I... I mean, I, I had met a lot of guys playing golf through the years. Um, I've met Charles Barkley, played with him in Pro-Am and Decatur, Alabama. And I have to give people I've played with, uh, David Robinson. I mean, I've met some people, but I have not met anybody outside that I would from the show that I would have met other than, you know, maybe like Rick Smith or somebody that I would never probably cross paths with. But I will say one thing, in, when I played on the Hooters tour with Charles Barkley and um, we played in a shootout in Decatur, Alabama, that man is a total class act. He sat there, there was probably 200 kids, 300 kids, one autographs, and they were all piled around him. And he stood up and he's like, hey, get in line. He said, I'll sign everyone. I will sit here and sign every one of your autographs. And I... I, I got had a whole different respect for him because you know what? Most athletes won't do that. Yeah. I'll be honest cool. with you. He sat right there and he signed every autograph, every single one of those kids. And it was just a kind of, it was kind of one of those things you look at and you say, if that ever happens to me, I would want to be like that. I would want to do things that make an imprint on society. And I'm hoping every day that something that I do makes an imprint on society. That's what we're all here for. That's cool, Mike. That's really cool. Listen, I appreciate the time. I'm a big fan of yours. I know we had from the surveys we did, we have plenty of fans still out there. I don't care how much time has gone by. And uh, this isn't goodbye because we're going to talk to you in a few weeks when we do the reunion show. So thanks again for today. And we look forward to talking to you soon. Sounds good. Thank you. Take care. Okay, bye. Bye Bye-bye.